Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on trauma-informed approaches for survivors of human trafficking. We're glad to have you join us. My name is Bonnie Zampino. I'm the Engagement Specialist at Ukeru Systems. And before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to best participate in today's event. We have taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. You're listening in using your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. We are eager for this to be as interactive as possible. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session before we end today's presentation. In addition, we welcome you to join us throughout this conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag starts with you. A few other items we wanted to make you aware of for those of you who need a certificate or continuing education credit for this discussion, we can make that available to you upon request. Continuing education credit is available through Shepherd University with an associated fee of $49. In addition, a copy of this presentation will be distributed in the next few days. We are recording this conversation and we'll post that on our website later this week. The topic of human trafficking and exploitation of children is one that is very important to us here at Ukeru Systems. If you've attended one of our webinars in the past, you know that we focus a great deal on trauma-informed care. For individuals who have experienced traumatic events, such as violence and victimization, sexual abuse, physical abuse, the impact of re-experiencing that trauma through the use of restraints and seclusion can be devastating. Survivors of human trafficking have inevitably experienced a great deal of trauma. Supporting these individuals requires taking all of this into consideration, identifying triggers and using trauma-informed approaches. Today, we are lucky to be able to hear from Dee Dee Wallace, who is with ICE, Homeland Security Investigations. Dee Dee is the Victim Assistance Specialist for HSI DC. Dee Dee has served on the Task Force's Victim Services Committee since 2013, and in 2016 became co-chair for the Outreach and Awareness Committee. Our other speaker, Rachel Reeder, is a member of the Grafton team. Rachel is the director of the Loudoun County Youth Shelter. And at this point, I will turn the discussion over to Dee Dee. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for wanting to uh, talk about this topic. A lot of people don't. I want to uh, start off by thanking Bonnie and everybody at Grafton for giving me this opportunity to reach out and talk to a lot of people that I frankly might have not have been able to talk about human trafficking to. So welcome, everybody, and thank you for wanting to be here. So we're going to progress to the next slide, which is going to be the HSI slide. Um, and then just so you have an idea of who HSI is, just because a lot of people want to know why are we trying to do this work. HSI is the leading federal law enforcement agency, and we've been deemed the leading um, agency for human trafficking um, simply because originally when we looked at human trafficking, we were under the impression that this was going to be people from another country, not understanding that we actually victimize people within our own country. Um, and so that's kind of how um, HSI got involved, and I have the honor and the privilege of working with everybody. As a victim assistance specialist, my job is to be a bridge. I am the bridge between law enforcement, nonprofits, and also the victim. You'll have to forgive me because I say the word victim because I am a system-based victim advocate. You're either the bad guy or you're the victim. So that gives people... When I say victim, it gives them like a title and it gives them the protection that they deserve. It's not that I feel that they should stay in the victimization or being a victim. I feel that they're survivors, well, because of where I work, I say the word victim. So I apologize for everybody who, that's a harsh word to, but you're going to hear me say it a lot. So if we can progress to the next slide, you'll see some pictures on this slide and it's going to be with two young girls. Um, if you look at the top picture, if anybody is familiar with that photo, it's because her name is Amanda Todd. Amanda Todd was a victim of sextortion. She lived in Canada. 
she went on YouTube and told everybody by little on um, little note cards of her victimization. And shortly after that, she committed suicide. Her victim or her perpetrator was actually in another country other than Canada. Um, and I actually worked with some of the victims in the United States um, that the same uh, person was victimizing. And it all had to do with social media and young vulnerable people being on there and looking and trying to find that connection that they couldn't find in person. The other young girl that you'll see is um, a young lady that I worked with with a human trafficking case out of Stafford. Um, when we got done with the case, uh, there was 27 women involved. Her trafficker got 25 years in a plea agreement because of how bad he's considered a gorilla pimp. Um, and gorilla pimps mean that they keep control of their victims by brutality. And he picked her up. On, on in Florida where somebody else had dropped her off and left her penniless in a hotel and she was particularly vulnerable because she didn't know where she was at how she was going to survive and he simply walked into her hotel room and told her that he would take care of her for the rest of her life and she had nobody to turn to because her mom was in a mental health facility on um, and had been there for quite a long time so we can progress so the reason why I have both of those titles when um, you saw it had child exploitation and human trafficking is because I need you to understand that it can go together. It doesn't mean that human trafficking is separate from child exploitation. It means that both of them can flow into each other. So we're going to talk about the legal definition. A lot of words on the page, isn't it? And it's hard when you start looking at it. Like, what, what do we mean by all this? What are we looking for specifically? So what I wanted you to understand are the first three, or you'll see them, the only ones that are highlighted, right? They're dark. It's the force, the fraud, and the coercion. The force, fraud, and coercion is what I have to prove for an adult sex trafficking case. It is also what I have to prove in a labor um, trafficking case. Now, all this changes when we start talking about a minor. When you're working with anybody under the age of 18, I don't have to prove any of those in a case. All they have to prove is the commercial sex aspect. Now, that, it's confusing to a lot of people and including law enforcement because when you think commercial sex, a lot of people always attribute that to the money. So I um, have somebody with a john after the, they've done and completed the act, that's when the money is exchanged. But would it surprise you that sometimes it's not money? Sometimes that commercial exchange could be drugs it could be for, um, I um, sadly know of a case where a husband, with com the commercial part of it, gave his wife to having windows be put in his house. It's some type of commercial or good that they're getting in exchange for the victim. So when you're thinking of young people, keep in mind the drug aspect, keep in mind that this could be any type of goods in exchange. So those are the three things that we're looking for when we're building an adult case. But I'm focusing more on this topic with the, the minors. So I, I want you to understand that with that being the minors, we don't have to prove anything but the commercial part of it. Now, if you think that's easy, it's not. And it's one of the hardest things that I have to do is to prove to either a judge or a jury coercion. Because if you can think in your head, what would coercion look like in a sex trafficking case? Well, when we are trying to look at coercion, we look at a relationship. We can look at having a threat to somebody, and that threat can have them, the relation being taken away from them. Because we understand, especially in sex trafficking, that the relationships are what we're looking for, right? That love. Love and hope could now be a coercion. We could stay on this topic forever, but I just wanted to put some stuff out there so you guys have a better idea of what it is. Thinking of labor, it is a little different, though, because even with the labor trafficking case, when it is a minor, I still have to do the force, the fraud, and the coercion. And again, the coercion could be to stay with the family. It could be staying in the United States. The fraud could be that somebody was being brought into the United States thinking that they were going to work in a particular field, maybe it's being a teacher, maybe it's being a landscaper, and instead they're forced to do basically slavery um, 
and they're not well taken care of. They're not fed. Um, they're demeaned. It's, it's as horrible as the sex trafficking, but just on the different levels. So if we can go to the next slide, please, with the child exploitation on it. Now, this does not come from me. This actually came from the National Missing and Exploited. And it has, in my, in my opinion, a really good way to explain child exploitation. Because you're talking about how abusive, how overwhelmed that these children can get when the exploitation starts and ends. Um, they don't understand that they're being victimized. They don't understand that they've been targeted. They don't understand the grooming. Um, all they know is that this is now their world and somebody else is coming to disrupt it. So the coercion aspect starts playing into this part of it also. The relationships start coming in because you can start looking at how our teens do sexting, um, how they don't think anything of sending photos to somebody who sent them a text message or on Twitter or on Snapchat um, and they just put themselves out there without realizing the damage that this could cause to them in a long-term basis. So if we can go to the next slide please. So this is a conversation that gets really interesting when I'm standing in a room with a, the parents and the kids in the same room. Teens and adults, do we look at the situation the same? I deal, because of my, my agency, I deal with a lot of different cultures, but I always like to remind people that we have multiple cultures even within our own families because of different ages. Um, I have a 28-year-old daughter and I have a seven-year-old son. It's a whole bunch of different language and TV shows and different everything going on. So in one situation, we have three different perspectives. So I'm in my 40s. So there's where I bring in for my past and everything that I know. My daughter's 28, so everything that she knows for her age and what she's familiar with. And then you add in a seven-year-old. So one, one situation, but three different perspectives, and it can change a whole bunch of things. Can we go to the next slide, please? So how do we look at trafficking? How do adults look at trafficking? How do teens look at trafficking? They're going to be different, right? Because I'm hoping, as adults, we only see the negative of trafficking. There is no empowerment for us. Unfortunately, that's not always true for adults or for teens. So if you look on the negative, it's pretty easy. Like, you could see all of that, and that all makes sense to you. Especially the substance abuse and the shame and the fear, physical abuse, um, the isolation. All of that makes sense to us because we, if we can conceive what a victim has to go through and what their life would be like. That all makes sense because these are all words that are incredibly impactful, incredibly um, overwhelming to somebody. And living in that type of situation, that all clearly you can see that. The empowerment, now that's a little different, isn't it? Because how can being a victim how can the isolation and everything else, the shame and everything that they're doing, how can they feel empowered? Well, that's where the manipulation from the trafficker comes in. That's where the uh, grooming of not only the trafficker, but also basically society starts coming in also. Because if you start adding in, where do teenagers and kids start learning about pimping? Where do they learn about prostitution? Well, it's going to come from their friends. It's going to come from social media. It's going to come from movies, books, music. You add all that in, and we don't always say that prostitution's bad. So maybe they feel like they're in control of the situation because maybe something's going on at home, and somebody is telling them what to do and how to do all the time. But what happens when you're removed from that situation and you're placed in a hotel room and you're told you can make up your mind when you go to bed? You can make up your mind when you, when you want to eat. You can do this or you can do that. Now, it won't stay that way because obviously the trafficker is going to want more control than that. But in the beginning, it's going to be slow like that. The boyfriend-girlfriend situation. What young person doesn't want to have somebody near them or have be attached to them? They not only want that for companionship, but it's a social status too, isn't it? You start looking at Valentine's Day, and people that never liked each other are going to start wanting to have somebody with them on that day. 
we magnify it, right? When you're talking to a teenager, you feel like you belong to somebody. Now, I've talked to young people that they have stayed in a trafficking situation, not because of how they feel to the trafficker, but because of how they feel to the other people in the trafficking situation. They have finally felt that there is somebody who cares about them and who wants to protect them. And they'll fight to stay in that situation. And dang it, they get to travel, right? Maybe because for the most part, they're not going to stay in one area. It could be that they're going to go to another city. They could go to another state. They could move all around. And it because you can't stay in one place because they're going to draw attention to themselves. But maybe if they've never done that with their family, now they're being introduced to it. They're going to be getting gifts because they're going to get new clothes and they're going to get new shoes and they're going to have their hair done. They're going to have their nails done. Now, this is very, it's a flaunting thing, right? It's like maybe they came from a family that has nothing because we know a lot of our victims are coming from the foster care system. A lot of them are going to be coming from families that maybe the parents are disinterested and they don't do things for the children. So to be given a gift just because, and that's how it's going to start. I love you, so I want you to have this coach purse. I care about you, so I'm going to take you to get your nails done. Well, what they don't realize is the trafficker is keeping a tally for everything that they have just now been given, and they're going to have to work that all off. If you can go to the next slide, please. So two different views. We can take that, and we can even look at society and look at the two different views, right? So the good one, if you could, if anybody around my age, you should recognize who that person is. That would be the trafficker from Risky Business. He was the one that Joel uh, had to um, pay off because he took all of his stuff. He was cool, and he was hip, and he was, you know, somebody that maybe somebody could see that they wanted to be. Like a teenage boy could look at Joel, who basically became a pimp, and they could look at this gentleman and be like, you know what, that's what I want to do. He parties all day. He has all these gorgeous women hanging off of him. He can show off all the cash. Great job. It's great. And then you look at the other one. Is that who we as adults see? Is that who we would like the rest of the world to see? The creepy guy who's letting everybody know that he's had sex with a young person and that he paid for it. Well, I'm hoping that the bad one is more of what we're finally getting everybody to see. That pimping and prostitution, it's not a good thing. But we're still having to go against these norms, these views and opinions of people, because unfortunately, a lot of people still do see this as what the sex trafficking looks like. That there is this really glamorous side, and maybe, just maybe, there's also an evil side. But it takes a while to get there for people to see that. If we can progress, please. We're going to talk about red flags, and I wanted to do this specific because um, we obviously we wanted to talk to uh, school personnel and anybody else who wanted to look at victimization with the victims in the school, and sometimes we don't always talk about that because sometimes that might look different than what somebody at home is going to see. So we can progress to the changes, please. So let's talk about personality. How could that change if they're in this type of um, situation? Well, looks are going to change. Because the person that they're with is going to want them to start looking different. You have to understand the trafficker is going to want to sell them to as many people as he can. So he's going to want them to look different than maybe what they're even comfortable with. It might mean clothing. The clothing might become tighter. It may become more suggestive. It might become newer. Maybe they were only in jeans or sweats. And now their clothing is going to shift a little more and become more feminine. Or maybe we're talking about looks. A lot of traffickers will change haircuts, will change hair color, will uh, piercings. This is going to be different because they're trying to raise um, the girl's attractiveness to the buyers. So that might be something you've noticed. The family dynamics. Maybe this child has never talked about family, but all of a sudden now they are. Maybe they've never talked about having somebody care about them but they do, they do now. And they refer to these people as family. It's not always going to be obvious. And, you know, obviously they're not going to say something like my trafficker, my pimp. 
they're going to talk to them as family. They're the boyfriend. They're the, the special uncle. They're the daddy. So that's going to be something that maybe um, teachers are going to hear more of when you hear a discussion with the teens talking about it. And I see teens, but this could also be children. Maybe their friends are changing because maybe their friends are aware of what they're doing and they don't like it. And they're trying to tell them to stop it. But if when you want to be with people who agree with you and then disagree with you, so the friends might be changing. Who they're hanging out with may be changing because maybe they've never even talked to somebody that, you know, everybody's kind of aware of that they're a partier, but now they are friends with them because their, out, their activities outside of the school have also shifted. So now they want to be more aware to some people that they've never been friends with. Social media. Maybe you're talking about a kid that doesn't understand. Maybe they're like me and they don't do Twitter and they don't do Facebook, but now they are. And they're going to talk about it a lot. And they're going to want to show people. You're going to see a lot more selfies. You're going to see these, these young people are the ones that are in the bathroom doing the selfies and suggest the poses. They're um, photos for Facebook and Twitter and everything. That's going to be changing too. The school will be changing, obviously, because they're not going to be able to spend enough attention on the school because now they have other things to do. They have somebody else or something else that is taking them away from school. They may also, unfortunately, be skipping school. They may um, not only be skipping school and not be paying attention, but their attitude towards school might be changing because now they are an adult because this is what they've been told. You don't need to be in school. We're showing you how you can make your own money. You don't need to listen to everybody else because you can live off of your own money and do what you want. Well, it's hard to switch that feeling of being an adult and feeling like you're in control of everything and then give it up when you go to school to somebody else. Unfortunately, this also will now include involvement potentially within the juvenile justice system. It could also include with truancy in the schools, the school counselors might be aware of this person. Um, everybody may be aware that there's something different about this child or teen, but you just can't figure it out. You can't put all the puzzles together because they're not giving you enough information. You just know that there's some red flags going off and you're trying to figure out where do we go from there. If we could go to the next one, please. So we're going to talk about signs of trafficking and exploitation now. So now you know that there's something going on. So what else can we be seeing? What are some things that are maybe a little more obvious? Well, let's put some slides up for you to look at. You'll see that there's a tattoo. Now, the difference between a tattoo and a branding are subtle, but they are there. Because you may go into the trafficking situation and be given a tattoo because that's what you want. That young person says, I want to show everybody I earned this tattoo. And you'll notice the tattoo says bottom B. Well, that signifies a hierarchy within the trafficking situation. And the bottom is actually somebody that's high ranking. So that status says to everybody else within the trafficking situation that I'm above everybody else, that I am going to tell you what to do and I'm going to be the enforcer for the trafficker. You could also be seeing tattoos of loyalty. You could see tattoos with a trafficker's name on it. You could see them with horseshoes, money signs. And like I said, they could start off as a tattoo, but in reality, it's more of a branding. Now the branding situation straight off is when the trafficker wants everybody else to be able to identify his people by that one tattoo. So pretty much when that happens, they're all the same tattoo. They're going to be put in an obvious place. A lot of the times it's on the neck, it's on the wrist, on, it's on the breast of the person that he wants because he wants to show his ownership to that person. And then we're going to notice like you see the young girl on the computer because they're going to be given on assignments. And if you're looking at the child exploitation part of it and they haven't gone into the trafficking, this is when a lot of the sexting, this is when a lot of the online chats are going on. This is a lot of where the grooming is going to be taking place. And this includes MS-13 will also be doing things like this. MS-13 is an international gang that particularly likes to look at young um, people, especially young girls, I hate to put it this way, but almost like a party favor because they're not 
officially a gang member, but they can be given to gang members as a gift to show their royalty and their dedication. So give them a young girl. You'll also notice the young lady that's in the cheerleading outfit. I want you to understand that she is actually a convicted sex trafficker. She was um, 17 years old and she was a head cheerleader. She wanted to buy a car, but she did not want to be involved in prostitution. So she found a young girl on her squad who had developmental delays and she convinced her, if you want to be my friend, you need to do this. You're going to have a phone, you're going to pick up the phone, and you're going to go where I tell you, and you're going to have sex with whoever I tell you. She then collected the money and then gave it to this, the young girl that you see in the photo. How this young girl was removed is the mom picked up of the victim, and she noticed her daughter was behaving and acting and dressing in a different way, and she called local law enforcement. So you need to understand that not only are our victims people that you wouldn't readily be able to recognize, nor are the traffickers. And then you see Beyonce. Beyonce is one of my favorite music on um, musicians. But if you recognize what she's doing with her hands, you'll know that that is a blood symbol. So that's part of the gangs. That's another um, sign that you're seeing for what our, um, our victims are maybe getting into. Because you have to understand, sex trafficking is right up there with gun or with drugs. It's a billion dollar a year industry. And gangs love that because it's less money going out, it's less chance of law enforcement finding their supply, and it's a really readily supply of people that they can find, unfortunately, and they can lure them in, and they can disguise about how they're doing it simply by inviting them into parties. If we can um, progress to the next slide, please. So let's talk about that. How do people meet? How does the trafficker meet the victims? How do the gangs meet their victims? Social media, you gotta love it. Not only does it help us get our good jobs, but it also helps the bad guys now reach out to the young people in the United States and all over the world. We protect our young. I hope so, I, that's my goal, to get everybody to do that. Um, but every time a young person has a phone, a tablet, or a computer, that's a doorway that somebody can use to walk into their life. So by having the social media and having it open and having their lives exposed, because they use it like a diary, right? They tell everything about themselves, they show what they look like, they take photos almost as if they're modeling. So it's an easy way for people to see what they're gonna look like. And then all they've gotta do is reach out and start talking to them. I had a young girl that was a child exploitation case and she had been talking to an adult who had been asking her to send on um, videos and naked photos of herself. And we're trying to get her to understand the seriousness of this. That you, you, you can't just keep accepting friend requests. You can't keep talking this to all these people you don't know. And as we're sitting there and she's holding her phone because we asked her to open it, she gets a friend request. She doesn't even blink. She just looks at us and accepts it because that's what they want. They want that look, I have all these people following me. I have all this attention on me. I have all these people who care about me. Well, that's all the trafficker needs. That's the doorway, and he just walks through it. And then the grooming starts. Then the relationship starts. And then slowly but surely, the requests are going to be met for whether it be photos, whether it be going out on a date, whether it just be a relationship in the beginning between the trafficker and the victim. It's going to be slow. Or, depending on the young person and their perspective of what sex is, it could even be faster. It could be within two to three days. If they can say to a young person, because I worked with a young MS-13 gang member, and she was offered $50 for every time she walked into a hotel room, well, she wasn't getting that $50 from her parents, and she felt like she had already had sex, so it just made sense for her to do it. We could go to the next slide, please. So who can be a victim? Unfortunately, that's a really hard thing to answer because I think it's more of who wouldn't be a victim. It's gonna be kids who feel isolated. It's gonna be kids who don't feel like there's anybody that really does care about them. Can we go to the next slide, please? Whoops, I'm sorry, my computer just died on me. All right, so the next thing we wanna talk about is the 
is on how do we, oops, I totally lost it. Okay, after the recovery. How do we answer a child's questions about after we do recover them? How do we tell them that everything is going to be okay, given what they've seen and what they've done? Are they going to have fear of what other people know that they've done? So can you imagine maybe that you've been posted on a place like Backpage? Backpage is where a lot of our traffickers would post our young people. And what if everybody in the school knew about what that child was doing? And now they've got to go back into the school with everybody knowing what had happened. They're also going to wonder, is there a normal? Can my normal ever come back? And how do we get past it all? So we've got all these questions, and we've got understanding that these young people don't even recognize that they're victims. Well, how does exploitation impact the victim? So I put some easy slides on there um, for you to look at it. Um, it's, they're going to be potentially cutting because of how they feel about themselves and everything they've gone through. The drugs are going to be something that, I don't know about you, but if I had everything that, I, that they had to live through, all the rape and all the abuse and everything else that they had to see, it would make sense that to them they want to numb it. Unfortunately, in order to numb that in their head, they're going to look at alcohol and drugs. And also all the FTIs, all the broken bones, everything else that they've had to suffer. Can we please go to the next slide, please? So how does it impact them in school? Well, are they going to be able to interact with their peers? Are they going to be able to focus on what a normal child may be doing? Can they keep, you know, catch up to their subjects? Because can you just jump right back in and have a normal class time and with all the focus being gone, with the knowing everybody's talking about you, can we get back to that? And then they're going to worry because they're kids, right? They're going to worry about their reputation. And are they going to be able to, to have an attitude that is receptive to being able to get back into the schools and to hear what people are trying to help them with? Can we go to the next slide, please? So what helps and what hinders? Well, that's a hard question to ask. So I think one of the big things that we need to look at when for the what helps is, is this their first trauma? Because if it's not, you know that you're also going to be dealing with past traumas. And if it's the first, then they're going to be dealing with all these new emotions that maybe for the first time in their life that they're having to deal with. If they don't have family and support or if they do have family and support, it goes both ways. If you feel you're alone, who is going to pick you up? Who is going to give you that shoulder to talk to? Obviously, counseling is going to be huge. But if we can get them past why they were vulnerable in the first place, then maybe we can figure out how not to have them go back into that situation. And, of course, in my opinion, and this is my humble opinion, the attachment to the trafficker. Because if they love them and they hope that they can get back together, that's going to be one of the hardest things that we're going to be working with to get them to understand that that person was bad. That person harmed you when all they can think of is that person loved me. Can we go to the next slide, please? So who can help? The next slide, please. So there's some numbers up there. So there's going to be the National and Missing and Exploited. That's their phone number. Please call the local police. If you suspect that a child is in danger, the local police are going to be the first ones who can respond to this. They're going to be the quickest, and they're going to be able to immediately address your concerns. There's also the HSI tip line. You're able to go if you see something and you want to say something, and you can do that anonymously, or you can do it as an email. And then if you could go to the next slide, please. And that's my contact information. There's the tip line again. There's also the uh, DH, um, DHS Worldwide Web um, site, which is going to be the blue campaign, which is our posters and everything I hope you've seen before. And then my contact information. Um, feel free if after this um, webinar, if you want to uh, contact me, I'm on call 24 hours a day. So you can email me, text me, however you like to get a hold of me. Um, and I know that we're going to have some questions and answers. Um, so please feel free at the end of this. Um, let me know what I can do to help. Um, and Bonnie, I'm turning it back over to you.
Thank you so much, Dee Dee, for sharing that important information with us about human trafficking and child exploitation. And I know there are a number of questions um, for you that we're going to get to in just a few more minutes. But with that in mind, we'd like to talk about trauma-informed approaches to supporting the survivors of human trafficking. And with that, Rachel, I'd like to turn the conversation over to you. Thanks, Bonnie. So prior to my current position as the director of the Loudoun County Youth Shelter, um, I worked as in Grafton's Residential Treatment Center in Berryville, Virginia as a therapist. Um, through collaboration with a specialized consulting trainer, we developed a program to work with child victims of human sex trafficking. This included a focus on the topics that Dee Dee introduced, including power and coercion, gang dynamics, and the role of substance dependence and resilience factors. Um, the Residential Treatment Center um, provides a unique environment for maintaining safety and beginning therapeutic intervention with youth have, who have experienced sex trafficking. Um, there are many positive factors, but there are also some negatives. Um, for a youth who's entering residential treatment, often through um, a mandate, you know, identification by their treatment team or the legal system, they may perceive an increase in factors including powerlessness, lack of choice, isolation, um, stigmatization, and they may have a variety of challenging behaviors. Um, these may include sexual boundary challenges, uh, manipulation of peers and adults, oppositional behaviors, aggression, and attempted elopement. Um, as Dee Dee mentioned, that could be back to the people that they identify as their family. Um, their trauma responses, these are trauma responses to the significant ma manipulation that was used by their abuser. So the residential treatment uh, setting may include um, a safe visitor and call list, and um, an end to access to social media. And we understand that these are temporary things, but they allow the youth to be safe um, to begin the treatment process. In addition to providing direct services, the therapist interprets behaviors through the lens of trauma and directs individualized treatment interventions in the milieu. For example, uh, grooming behaviors are um, responses to trauma that are often noted for uh, victims of sex trafficking. And what these are are um, things like lending, borrowing, favors um, that determine the status of the individual within the group um, and are working to desensitize the other people in the group to that power dynamic. In addition, um, we may have significant recommendations regarding interactions with male staff to help maintain the uh, therapeutic relationship and make sure that the male staff are aware of the potential for um, interactions to be misinterpreted. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, in terms of treatment recommendations, human sex trafficking is an especially complex trauma, which includes emotional, physical, sexual abuse, as well as manipulation. Um, as Dee Dee mentioned, the client is unlikely to identify as a victim, um, even though that word may be used to describe them. So as a result of this, recommendations for the treatment include a significant emphasis on building self-esteem and empowerment. Um, victims need to be engaged in decision making and as much as possible um, help to direct their own treatment. Motivational interviewing towards positive goals is, is a, a large part of this, but it is harder than it may typically be even for other teenagers because they may name goals such as to be famous, to make money, to get back to my man, um, and this may include ruminative letters that they write in their therapeutic journals. So there are a lot of different ways that um, the challenges can present when working to engage the, the client. In addition to that, providing positive leadership opportunities um, with, with significant supervision and also education on factors that include consent to start conversations about the victim experience. Alternative therapies that do not force verbalization of trauma um, can be very effective and in our Berryville program are used uh, widely. These include music therapy, <clears throat> art therapy, um, equine assisted therapy, and also potentially drama or yoga. Um, these are best used in, co in close collaboration with the primary therapist and the treatment team so that um, the interactions can be interpreted within the lens of the primary traumas. Next slide, please. 
All right, other recommendations. <laughs> One of the biggest challenges here is that treatment will likely feel worse for the individual before it feels better as they're resensitized to the emotions involved in the trauma. Um, Real-time, clear communication with team members is vital. So this includes team members both inside and outside of the treating organization. Sharing information across areas of um, education, physical health and medications, the family system, the legal system, and the therapeutic team. Um, this, as you can imagine, gets pretty complicated in terms of releases, but that, that um, case management role is super important here. Um, and in addition, the family engagement focus. So um, thinking about the family's response to potentially just learning that their child had been involved in trafficking, there are frequently strong and conflicting emotions both from the parent towards the child and the child towards their parent. Um, this may include the allocation of blame and the concern, the family may have con significant concerns about their safety, um, including regarding the reintroduction of the client to the home and especially if gang involvement was present. Um, there needs to be a reason, connection reestablished between the parent and child. And so that involves work with other agencies to determine the best interests of the child and advocate for their needs. Um, things like frequent visitation and supervised um, phone calls and eventually passes um, to work the client towards being safe in the community are part of this process. And in addition, involvement of siblings who may have experienced secondary trauma and have their own thoughts and feelings about the client re-entering the home. Uh, residential treatment is only the beginning of a longer course of treatment and safety concerns heighten, especially around the point of transition back to the community. So discharge planning is particularly intense for these clients. All right, next slide, other strategies. So the ECARO system blocking techniques are um, used in our Berryville program as well as at the Loudoun County Youth Shelter and are a vital part of preventing re-traumatization, which can happen through physical touch in a crisis situation. So they allow us to maintain safety without having the power dynamic that comes from going, quote, hands-on. Um, when we, I referenced previously some of the very challenging behaviors that could include um, self-harm, aggression, or attempting elopement, um, the Ucaro techniques allow us to keep the client physically safe. In addition, uh, the ACARO techniques allow us to work within the power dynamics um, that the client presents at the time. So they may escalate a situation and the ACARO techniques allow us as providers and practitioners to feel um, a sense of comfort um, knowing that we, we won't have to go, quote, hands-on. There are significant barriers to trust with these clients already, and so you can imagine that, that restraint would further challenge the therapeutic relationship. Uh, furthermore, person-centered work is, is a strong recommendation here. Building on, on the client's identified strengths, they may have significant difficulty identifying strengths that were different than those that were presented by their trafficker. So looking at positive identity and um, positive future goals as a major part of this therapy. Um, in addition, the mediation framework, so addressing conflict using win-win strategies um, is most likely to be successful. And then um, TFCBT, or trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, is a common model used in addressing internalized messages from the trauma experience. And that training is available online and is, is uh, very valuable. All right, next slide, please. Um, at the emergency youth shelter, so um, working at the youth shelter, I've noticed a significant difference between the community and residential environments. In an unlocked community setting, managing clients safely can be especially challenging. Uh, the Loudoun County Youth Shelter is a co-educational facility with um, clients between the ages of 12 and 18, and we have um, up to 18 clients at a time. The same emphasis on communication applies, especially with external, um, with external community members um, with even more intensity. So for example, uh, communication between the shifts of staff and interpretation by, um, by the case manager are especially important here. 
There is also, of course, a potential for recruiting. So if you have um, a trafficking victim looking at the dynamics of grooming, of power within the group, we have to have a high level of supervision um, and awareness of those dynamics and be reporting those to the therapeutic team. Um, the Loudoun County Trafficking Multidisciplinary Team, or MDT, is a benchmark program that was developed at no additional cost. So what that means is that members of agencies that were already in place meet frequently to collaborate and discuss the challenges in the community and the best ways to meet um, the client's needs. In addition, the Sex Trafficking tax Task Force monitors activity and trends in the community and directs resources of the involved agencies. And then I have here some references. Um, the traffic, or excuse me, tracking the hidden wounds um, is a excellent resource which is on the um, Department of Health and Her Human Services website and is a, um, a summary of a lot of the research that was done on human trafficking as well as identification of some areas for continued research. Um, Deepa Patel uh, from Trauma and Hope is, was our consultant and is also an excellent resource. And I'll turn it back over to Bonnie and be uh, welcoming any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was excellent information. And we do have several questions that have come in um, from our participants today. So to remind everyone who's still with us, you can still submit questions at this time through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. We'll try to answer as many as we can um, before the end of the webinar. And if we can't get to you, we will attempt to follow up with a response. Um, the first question that came in was from David, who asked if uh, sex trafficking victims were only girls. And I thought Dee Dee could answer that for us. Absolutely. So, no. The answer to sex trafficking um, with the victims, especially teens, is not that they're on. Um, it's not just girls. Um, we do have young boys, particularly young boys, who are in the LGBTQ uh, community. They're particularly vulnerable to sex trafficking. Thank you so much. Another question um, that we received was um, working with all ages of those with autism. We are seeing an uptick in those with ASD being targeted for illegal activity, for instance, drug mules, stealing, et cetera, being targeted as, as a means to medication and sex, consensual or unconsensual with or without understanding. Is this on the police radar? Seems that the label of autism spectrum disorder becomes a gray area that no one wants to address. That's very this is true. Rachel. And it's a, yeah, please go, Rachel. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say this is something that we're aware of um, here as well, um, especially in the community program, the U Shelter. Uh, but it's something that, as I was mentioning, the, um, the Human Trafficking Task Force that I've heard mentioned. Um, that's all I wanted to say. What Rachel's not telling you is her task force is utterly amazing and very thorough. So when they um, are looking at their victims, that, that is something that they're looking at for particularly vulnerable populations um, so that they can um, start putting in protective um, barriers around them quickly. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. The, um, the human sex trafficking multidisciplinary team, um, so the, the task force addresses the human trafficking from a community uh, kind of higher level viewpoint. The, the um, multidisciplinary team addresses each individual complex case and making recommendations for treatment and services. Um, so thinking about the complexity that having autism spectrum would add to these already complex cases, that's really you know, the, um, the best avenue moving forward to address all of the, the challenges that, that come in. Thank you so much. Another question goes back to uh, the initial question about the the focus being girls and boys. Uh, this participant works with many adolescent boys who've been trafficked, and so they're looking for resources to help support that population. Do you all have any resources um, that's more geared towards 
uh, young men. Rachel, I hope you've got a good answer because unfortunately, I don't know of that many organizations that are specific for young boys in trafficking situations. I would say the same, that I don't know of many that are specific for young boys. I do know that the LGBT community, um, there are community organizations that work with the range of, um, of challenges that these individuals can face um, going through their teen years um, and would be a, a positive resource. These tend to be different community to community. So depending on the area where you are, you may have um, more or fewer resources available. Okay, um, we'll take a few more of these. Um, this person says that they advocate for a child who hits all of these red flags and have reported it several times to authorities with no real attention. Any suggestions on what this person can do moving forward? That's a hard one. I, I hate to hear something like that. Um, I will let you know that if you make a report to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, um, and I'm sorry, I don't know that number right off the top of my head, when you make a report and you give them as much information as you can, that that then goes out to multiple legal um, and law enforcement uh, places. So it's not just like a local surrogacy, it's also federal, um, and it's a lot of the task force members. So maybe we can bring it attention to somebody who it resonates with, it means that they, they're more aware of what's going on and they can offer assistance. I'm really sorry that happened. It's just sad to hear that. The only other thing I would add is getting in touch with, um, you know, in, in the state of Virginia, things tend to be county to county. I believe that's the, the same across most states. So getting in touch with the um, with the community, community service agency or community service board for your community um, and having the case manager um, involved with the child, or if there's not a case manager, um, having one assigned to look at some of the behaviors that are seen as challenging, which could be um, drug use, running away, sexual promiscuity, and addressing it from a treatment standpoint um, until law enforcement are able to pick it up. So they're excellent recommendations. Um, Lisa Knight asks, is the current opioid epidemic exacerbating the problem of sex trafficking? Rachel, do you want to take that one? Sure. I would say absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, thinking about the connection between um, substance dependence and what Didi had mentioned about um, about coercion, um, that can be a way that the um, that the victim is is maintained in um, in a trafficking situation. Um, it also it also complicates the recovery um, in a very major way because they're dealing with the active um, addiction as well as the uh, recovery from the from the traumatic events. That's why I had Rachel say because she made it sound way better than me just saying yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have two great experts with us today. Time for just a few more questions if you two are open to continuing to answer these. Sure. Absolutely. Great. Um, the next question is, how involved are you with human trafficking of youth being sent abroad? Are you informed of the high traffic areas in, for instance, the DMV that meets major interstates to transport youth? Um, I will say that we're involved if we know about it, and that's the sad state of affairs, at least for law enforcement. If we have a tip or we have an idea and we are able to start an investigation, then we're definitely going to follow that. But if we're not aware of it, then we're just not going to, you know, obviously we're not going to be able to help or do anything. The only other thing I would add is that for the um, Northern Virginia Human Sex Trafficking Task Force, which is separate from the, um, from the uh, Loudoun County specific task force, um, mm -hmm. I definitely have heard that that any crossing state lines um, or especially um, um, going out of country hugely complicates these cases. So the only other thing I would it add does. is that is that just legally that that really um, causes quite a additional challenge. It does. But once you start looking at an international human trafficking, 
that means that you're going to have to be working with a federal law enforcement agency because we're going to be needing to reach out to the country that where those victims are going and working with those local law enforcement and also like the their own criminal acts that are taking place there. Another question is, um, is there a racial breakdown of trafficked victims? And if so, what is it? I know that there are. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. I just got this weird recording. <laughs> um, so. I can tell you that I think Polaris has broke down victim stats for phone calls that have been um, received, and I believe Shared Hope might have some information on that, but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what, what that would look like in the state of Virginia. The only thing I would say is that um, that there isn't a overwhelming breakdown across socioeconomic status, across um, nope. race or ethnicity. So. Uh, that's one of the things that, that may be surprising to some people is that with the clients that I've worked with, there isn't a, you know, kind of a um, typical client and there definitely, you know, are some protective factors, in, you know, involved in socioeconomic status, but it's not um, a guarantee at all. Mm -hmm. And the questions keep pouring in. Um, <laughs> um, so someone was asking to piggyback on an earlier question um, about what steps are taken for cultural sensitivity, um, feeling that often their requests for help of, for children of color are often ignored. Um, is that something that is being addressed in the task forces and law enforcement community with cultural sensitivity? Um, speaking for, so for me, I sit on every single human trafficking task force in the state of Virginia and in D.C. Um, and culture sensitivity and victim sensitivity is something that we take very seriously. Um, we actually do trainings on it. Um, we want to make sure that people are aware of the fact that you have to be sensitive to every single person that we encounter in every way that we, or every time that we talk to them or engage with them, we need to be reminded and keep that in our forefront because we could do more damage trying to help them than even the trafficker if we're not sensitive to that. Um, but that's just like the task force of law enforcement. Um, yep, that, that I'll, just, I'll just go with that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, there are still questions that, that are outstanding, but we are running out of time. Um, what we will do is attempt to um, send uh, some responses through email for the questions that remain outstanding. Um, some of the questions have to do with how to um, obtain copies of the presentation. So um, for that, we will be emailing the recording to everyone who registered for this webinar and additionally the recording along with the slides will be made available at ukerusystems.com within the next two days and that information can be shared at, uh, at schools and workplaces. Um, you can also send us an email at info at ukerusystems.com and ask for a certificate if you'd like uh, that to show that you attended today's webinar. And um, we just would like to thank everyone for being with us to today and we are at the conclusion of our time together. Dee Dee and Rachel, thank you so much for presenting today. Thank you everyone for joining us for this discussion. Of course, we hope that this is not the end of the dialogue, but just the beginning of this very important conversation. So to stay in touch, please be sure to follow the hashtag starts with you on Twitter. On behalf of all of us, thank you once again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.